Welcome to the lecture series under e Sikshna program of VTU Karnataka. This is Professor Umar Rao bringing you the lecture series on transmission and distribution. In the last session, we saw the difference between a feeder, a distributor, a service main and an interconnector. And we also saw that the distribution system is the last leg of the power system where the power is given to the consumer. Let us proceed and see how distribution systems are classified. So, whenever we classify anything, we have to keep a parameter for comparison. So, one way of classifying the distribution systems is depending on the type of current. So, we already saw that you have AC transmission and DC transmission. Similarly, you have AC distribution and DC distribution based on the nature of current. Normally, most of the distribution systems are AC, but we saw that DC has entered made a comeback in the transmission. Likewise, with solar power technology improving and being adopted at the distribution level, slowly DC distribution systems are also becoming popular. And just like we had HVDC, now we have LVDC, low voltage DC. So, AC systems are widely adopted, they are simple, cost effective. DC distribution systems are seen to be a viable option today because of generation of DC voltages in solar photovoltaic systems. Next, depending on the type of construction, just like how you had transmission, you have overhead distribution and underground distribution. In India, most popular is the overhead distribution, it is cheaper and of course, we have underground distribution where the aesthetics is very important and you know where you have lot of transport etcetera or water bodies. Underground systems are employed where overhead systems are not preferred because of right of way. Right of way is an even more problem on the distribution side because on the distribution system you have the residential people, commercial establishments. Okay. So, sometimes it might be very expensive to buy the right of way for establishing distribution overhead lines. So, in such cases underground systems are popular. And based on the type of connection, you have radial, parallel, ring main or mesh systems and interconnected systems. And then you can classify based on the number of wires. So, you have two wire that is for single phase, three wire that is three phase without a neutral and four wire with a neutral. Three wire systems and four wire systems are normally preferred, but many domestic consumers may get only the line to neutral voltage. You may not get a three phase supply at your residence. Three wire systems can be used for balanced loads in the industries. You can use three wire systems. However, if the system is unbalanced, a four wire system is preferred. Okay. So, we do not use three wire systems if we expect imbalance in the distribution of the loads over the three phases and we will see the reason why shortly in the coming sessions. So, these are the various way of classifying distribution systems. Now, again we have primary and secondary distribution. 
So, the higher transmission voltages from 33 to 400 kV or maybe even above. So, they are used to transmit powers from generating stations to substations. Normally, 400 kV and above is popularly used, 33 kV if the generating plants and the power is small and closer to the load center. So, for the primary distribution, these voltages are stepped down to 66 to 3.3, 66, 33, 22, 11, 6.6, 3.3 with the help of power transformers. So, I need at the consumer, lowest consumer level, I need between 230 to 440 volts. Now, you will be saying sometimes we say 400 volts, 415 volts, 440 volts, so it is a range. It is a range of voltages permitted. So, I have different voltage levels requirement on the distribution side. So, the primary distribution lines are called as feeders. We saw what are feeders. Feeders are conductors, distribution lines where there is no tapping in between. Okay, there is no tapping in between. So, from the feeder I give it to different distributors. So, feeders normally carry bulk power from the substation to a local point, from the substation to a local point. So, if your load requirement is less than 5 MVA, say an apartment, I have an apartment with 100 or 1000 houses. So, I will need about 5 MVA. So, then we have what is called as a secondary distribution system. So, there the power transfer will be at a lower voltage. So, you can get to secondary substations, you can have about 3 to 4 feeders. So, I hope you are getting what is happening. See, I generate around 22 kV, I transmit at 400 kV, okay. then at the primary distribution substation, I step it down to say 132 kV or 66 kV and then through feeders. So, there is no tapping in between through feeders I give it to smaller substations where the voltage is further stepped down to 11 kV and through distributors the smaller substations will be giving power to the consumers. Through distributors the smaller substations will be transferring power to the consumers. So, the primary distribution system primarily consists of feeders that deliver power from distribution substations to distribution transformers. So, the beginning of the feeder you have a breaker because if there is any fault the breaker must protect the equipment. So, it will cut off the feeder. So, we already saw what a feeder is. It is a conductor that connects the substation to the area where the power is to be distributed, one conductor. Generally, no tappings are taken from the feeder, so the current in it remains the same throughout. So, you can see here from the grid, so I have a 33 by 11 kV transformer. And then there is 11 kV underground cable, so there is an industry here. Just see this is a very beautiful network, it has a lot of things here. So, this is an industry which is taking power at 11 kV, okay. And there is also distributed generation here, wind power, wind power, okay. And then from this same, this is the substation here, it goes to some small town where there are offices and flats and then again it is stepped down, stepped down from 11 kV to 415 volts that is the local transformers, the roadside transformers you see and that is supplied to domestic houses, domestic houses and then here I have another 11 kV overhead line and then I have a pole mounted transformer a pole mounted transformer and so again this is giving me 415 volts three phase and you can see phase to neutral voltages are supplied to the houses, phase to neutral voltages are supplied to the houses. Then again maybe there is an another 
underground single phase is taken to supply some small suburban. So, you see here now there is again power coming from another substation 132 or 33 kV from another substation. This is typically what a distribution network looks like. So, you have power coming maybe from different substations supplying industry, supplying commercial establishments like offices, hospitals, schools and service utilities like government uh, services like lighting, street lighting and then you have domestic consumers and then supplying some farms and then uh, individual houses and you have a distributed generation there, wind energy and these uh, houses may also have solar rooftop generation. Okay. So, the entire I have just shown a brief layout. So, now we will provide suitable switches that is breakers to suitably open or close to improve the reliability. So, here you can see there are two substations here power coming here and here. So, I will decide you know I will say maybe I will say okay, the power here this part I supply from here and these I supply from here and maybe I provide a switch here. But then if a fault occurs and some power is cut off then I close the switch so that maybe the power can be drawn from the other feeder and so on. So, you can you can decide that is a very important aspect of the design. Now, we saw what are radial feeders again we will just revisit them for continuity. So, each consumer is connected to a single feeder. So, see each consumer is connected to a single feeder all this this is the feeder. These are all the radial feeders these are all the radial feeders. So, I will have one small distribution center here one distribution center here. So, you see here this is the source, this is the main feeder and then it goes to different loads. So, you see this is how the network looks like. Now, you see here I have one radial feeder different houses are connected. So, the thing is in a radial system it is easy to construct just from one point to another point. I told you sometimes in the network feeders and distributors are used interchangeably, feeders and distributors are used interchangeably. So, advantages are simple and heavy industrial roads always want radial. So, if this is an industry, if this is an industry I would prefer not to even here. If this is an industry, I would prefer to just not give a tap power anywhere. I want a radial system. I want exclusively for myself. So, heavy industrial roads require that radial feeders for supplying power point to point. Radial means one point to another point. And isolated loads with a heavy load density, say a village with a cluster of houses, again I will run a radial feeder. So, these are the normal cases in which radial feeders are used. The disadvantage is I do not have alternate paths in a radial feeder, I do not have alternate paths. Therefore, the reliability is poor, reliability is poor and more likelihood of consumers being without supply in the event of a fault. Now, if the load is further away then I need longer, longer feeders to extend meet the loads. And finally, I told you the problem if I have a long feeder, the consumers at the far end of the line would be subjected to lesser voltages. So, the voltage fluctuation will be more as you move away from the source end. So, these are all some of the disadvantages of radial feeders though they are widely used because they are very easy and simple to construct. Next we have parallel feeders. So, you see here 
I have feeder 1 and feeder 2. Okay. I have a transformer. So, let us say power is coming here. So, partially the power goes here and then it partially it flows through this and here. So, say this is P1, this is P2, okay. P1 plus P2. So, P1 will be equal to P2 if the two feeders are identical. If they are identical in length, the material etcetera, P1 will be equal to P2. Then again here I will have P, P1 plus P2 and this will get divided depending on what is the requirement of the houses. This is a parallel feeder. Now, the advantage is supposing this feeder there is an outage, then P1 plus P2 can flow through this feeder 2 provided feeder 2 can handle P1 plus P2. Supposing feeder 2 is designed only to handle P2, then it cannot take, it will also get overloaded that will also trip, that will also trip. So, let us consider some cases, let us say feeder 1 trips, right. So, feeder 1 trips means immediately what, what happens, I have to cut out some load because the net load requirement is P1 plus P2. So, the line feeder 1 has tripped, so my capacity is now only P2. So, some of these loads will have to be tripped and this, this power will also reduce because the loads are tripped, right. That is the first case. So, some partial, partial power loss to some of the consumers, that is the first case. The second case is supposing feeder 2 is capable of taking both P1 and P2 together, then none of the consumers will get affected. So, what I do? I transfer P1 plus P2 here, I transfer P1 plus P2 through this and I attend to this line maybe there is a short circuit because of a lightning or something and then again these breakers will close and original state will be restored, okay. So, most of these breakers they have what is called as an auto reclosing facility. That means, when the breaker opens after a fault, it will automatically close. So, if the fault has been cleared by then, then the breaker will remain closed, okay. So, supposing a lightning strikes feeder 1 and the breakers open and within a few you know minutes the light everything will be clear and it will close and normalcy will restore. So, even if feeder 2 is overloaded for a short time no problem. I told you uh, in my previous sessions that all equipment can handle overload for some time. So, this is the meaning of a parallel feeder. So, you see I am improving the reliability. So, whenever I talk of reliability means chances of losing power by the consumer. So, by providing a parallel feeder, I am improving the reliability. So, two or more radial feeders starting from the same or different substation. So, this or even this could you know this is coming from the same substation, this could even come from another substation. Feeder 1 could be fed through one and feeder 2 may be fe fed through another substation, that is also possible. So, different or same substations and running in parallel. So, equal load sharing is possible in case of identical parallel feeders, otherwise in the ratio, inverse ratio of their impedances. The system has gre greater reliability as it is capable of supplying the total load even in the case of faults. So, in case of fault on one feeder, the other feeder must be capable of supplying the entire load. This is expensive because I have to design each feeder to carry double the power, right. So, what happens under utilization of the line for reliability, for reliability. So, I told you, you want something, you have to sacrifice something. I want it to be reliable, so utility I am sacrificing. So, let us say these two are 100, uh, you know, 100 kilowatt lines, 100 kilowatt lines, right. So, both are carry, carrying 100 kilowatt normally. So, in the event of fault on one, the other should carry 200 kilowatts. So, in, I cannot use 200 kilowatts because that is the normal case. 
So, what should I do? I should use two 200 kilowatts, but under normal condition each will be carrying only 100 kilowatts. So, what is what am I doing? I am under utilizing a line capable of carrying 200 kilowatts most of the time I am I am only supplying 100 kilowatts through it, right? Because faults are rare, faults norm, normal, normal means what? Most of the time we have a normal condition. So, under normal condition you are only using 50 percent of its cap capacity. So, this is what is done, but then there are some critical loads you know, I told you like hospitals, you can afford you have lot of life uh, critical equipment which cannot afford to have supplies of and so on or some data centers, mobile towers though they all have their own uh, backup sources. So, when whenever the load is critical then yeah parallel feeders is a good option. This is another case this is this, this we already saw. So, under normal circumstance I will keep the breaker open and in the event of fault in either of the paths I can close the breaker and supply the entire load through one of them. And then ring main feeders. So, the primaries of the distribution transformers they form a loop, this it starts from the substation bus bar and ends at the substation bus bar returns to so it is called as a loop. So, if the fault occurs in any section, so you see everywhere you see the breakers they are all like switches, so many switches are there. Okay. Under normal operation I can close everything, I can close everything. So, power will flow through both paths here and here and how much power flowing through both the path will depend on the length of the lines and on the load on each system. So, if a fault occurs let us say there is a fault on this line then what I do let us say there is a fault here then I open this breaker. So, power to this is cut off and this break right. So, you can suitably open and close the breaker so that only the faulted small part is isolated. So, this improves the reliability even more than parallel faders. So, you can easily isolate the faulted section for repairs and the same time at the same time you can maintain continuity of supply to all the other consumers via the other feeder. So, what are the advantages of ring main? There are less voltage fluctuation at the consumer terminals and the system is very reliable as each distributor is fed via two feeders. And you can easily isolate it is called as selectivity. Selectivity means I only isolate the faulted section and maintain continuity to the rest of the system. So, selectively isolate it has improved voltage regulation and reduced losses it is expensive obviously that is the price you have to pay. Then I have interconnected systems or mesh systems they are ring main systems where you have a source from more than one substation. So, it further improves the reliability because it can even take care of substation faults because if one substation fails the other substation can give it. So, the example I gave of the London metro is extremely good. So, the metro is the load you have two substations feeding it and each substation is feeding through two parallel feeders. So, excellent excellent setup, but in spite of which it failed because of a very small error in the setting of the relay. Okay. So, there is redundancy since I have power being fed from two substations I have redundancy. Again it is expensive because under utilization, under utilization. So, I am keeping something extra, I am keeping some reserve thinking that when the fault occurs I will take the reserve. So, if the reserve is heavy it is called it is expensive because reserve you do not use most of the time and unlike a bank you know reserve here does not earn you any interest right. So, it is just 
money which is sleeping without, without being utilized. So, these are all some more pictures and they are all taken from the electrical engineering portal, right. So, you can see different ways of connections. So, you can see here loads substation, here there are two substations, substation 1 and substation 2 and you have distributors going to different loads. So, arrows in normally they represent loads, okay. So, this is another way, this is source 1, source 2, right and this is a main feeder, you have one here and one on this side and then you have loads. So, these are all different types of networks, practical networks which are very common in the distribution side. So, the interconnected system of course, greatly improves the system reliability and any area fed from one generating station during peak load. Peak load means what? When the load on the system is at the highest during the day. So, that will depend on the climate and the usage pattern of the consumers in the area. So, normally if it is a hot place, right, the peak load will be in the af afternoons where everybody puts on their uh, ACs. And if it is more of industries, then the peak load will normally be from 9 to 6 p.m. or 9 to 7 p.m. when all the industries are working. Supposing it is a cold country, the peak load may be sometime in the night when everybody turns on their heaters in the night. So, that depends, you know, the load pattern keeps changing. So, when the system is getting overloaded, supposing you have only one, it is fed from one station, okay. Then there is a chance that it gets overloaded during the peak hour. So, this type of an interconnected system can help in such cases and it will improve the efficiency of the system. So, this is all in the primary side. Now, coming to secondary side that is direct at the consumer level, it is a low voltage distribution. So, I want to step down to 415 volts three phase. So, in three phase if you remember the specification is always line to line voltage. So, 415 volts is line to line and you can use three wire systems for balanced loads and four wire systems for unbalanced loads. Lighting, most of the lighting equipment they all take single phase, single phase is supplied to the lighting equipment. You have three phase distribution. So, substations are constructed at the load centers to supply to the load areas which have a demand. So, what is there in a substation? Go and have a look at any substation near your house. So, you have switch gear that is the protective equipment and then you have bus bars and then you have fuses. So, bus bar is like a junction, bus bar is like a junction. So, if you just look at the book, it will be just one line, but please go make sure that you go to a substation and see how a bus bar looks like. And the voltage is stepped down to that required by the lowest level of the consumer that is the domestic and res residential consumers, lowest in terms of the voltage not in terms of importance, okay. Everybody, every consumer is important. Some consumers are critical because they are life dependent. So, the standard practice internationally is to identify three colors R, Y, B, red, yellow, blue, okay and you have a phase sequence what you have studied in networks. So, the phase sequence is either R, Y, B or R, B, Y and the three phase supply is given to the domestic supply, domestic uh, consumers. So, wherever they need a single phase load, it is given between one line and the neutral. The single phase load is supplied between the line and the neutral and some establishments may even require three phase. For example, they may have three phase pumps. If you take an apartment, they may have three phase pumps, they may, they, they may, they will require three phase for running the uh, elevators, lifts, so on. 
So, depending on the consumer and the requirement, thus three phase or single phase power is given. So, three phase three wire connection consists of three phase conductors R y and B. In a four, four wire system you have a neutral wire also, neutral wire also. So, you know that in a three phase system the neutral current, the neutral current is equal to I r plus I y plus I b. Neutral current is I r plus I y plus I b. So, when it is balanced you know that the sum of three balanced currents is 0. So, I r I y I b the sum is equal to 0 in the neutral current, but when there is an unbalance a neutral current exists. Under normal conditions the unbalance is very less, it is not going to be very high, but in the event of faults the level of imbalance can increase greatly causing heavy neutral currents. So, four wire systems are preferred because you can supply both three phase and four phase single phase loads with four wire system. So, you can see here I have an incoming supply, there is a there is a transformer okay, and this is the substation. So, this is coming from the transmission side. So, transmission side supply is coming may be at 230 kV or whatever step down at the substation and then you see four wires are taken, four wires. So, between three lines a three phase load is given could be an industry, could be an industry okay, three phase load and the neutral is also given and for domestic people single phase. So, between R n, Y n, B n. So, now you see here this load is between B and n, this load is between R and n. Uh, and this is this is between R and N, this is between Y and N. Now, what is this load? It is not one load, do not think of one bulb or something. This is this would be one small cluster of houses, maybe. This could be another small cluster, this could be another small cluster, maybe there are 50 houses here and so on. So, whenever your utility plans to connect the customers, they always see that you know this is say this is load in R this is load in y and this is load in b. So, the utility always tries to see that the three loads are balanced. Supposing you have 150 houses which have to be supplied, they would equally say 50, 50, 50. Okay. It is not that they will connect all the 150 between r and n and nothing between no, because then it becomes imbalanced, but still this I can only do my connected load. Okay. But there is no guarantee that all the 50 houses connected between R, Y, B each will be drawing the same amount of power all the time, no chance, no chance. Okay. So, there will always be some small amount of imbalance in the system and so the neutral provides a path for this current due to imbalance to flow because I n is equal to I r plus I y plus I b. Clear? Lighting and other single phase loads are connected between a phase and neutral and large air conditioners, motors are connected between the three lines, they are all three phase loads. Industries and commercial sectors prefer three phase power, they need three phase power to connect heavy machineries. So, bus bars are used to carry three phase power and from these bus bars individual connections are brought out to individual loads through cables. Last mile is normally through cables, the last stretch we use underground cables. Now, let us look at a beautiful video on the electrical distribution system. So, this video is available on YouTube and let us all acknowledge YouTube for making it available to us. So, in this video you will see how a utility manages the distribution system 
what are all the various equipment which has to be uh, installed in the distribution side. Okay? So, kindly go through the entire video, it lasts for about 10 to 12 minutes and it will summarize to you the practical aspects of whatever we have discussed starting from the distribution substation to the protection equipment and how to protect the consumers equipment. So, I think that video was good and what happens in a single phase system? It is a two wire. So, single phase means it is not line to neutral, it is a separate single phase distribution system itself. So, this is employed to supply power to domestic loads. They are connected between single phase and neutral at the substation bus bars. Okay. Now, we will concentrate first on AC distributors that is where AC power is being exchanged. So, how to specify the load? How do I specify the load? So, when we were solving transmission lines if you recollect whatever power we meant is the power at the receiving end. Likewise here too you know if I say the load is 5 MVA means 5 MVA is the requirement of the load on the distribution side. So, on a feeder, on a feeder the loads can be modeled as distributed load that means approximately let us say it is uniform over the feeder. I can you know say the load is so many kilowatts per kilometer that is called as distributed just like how we saw in, in transmission lines distributed parameter so many ohms per kilometer, so many microfarads per kilometer like that I can quote or I can specify the load also as a distributed load provided it is uniform along the length of the feeder. But however, if the load is being concentrated that means it is different at one point I have 50 kilowatts at another point I have 150 kilowatts and so on then we specify them as concentrated loads. So, both, both these are actually different ways of modeling the load, different ways of modeling the load. Next there are two things, I have to specify the power factor. Okay. So, power factor you know is the angle between two current and voltage. right? So, there are two ways you can specify, one is I take a reference. Okay. So, let us say I take the receiving end voltage as the reference that means the last at the end of the distribution line at the end of the distributor the voltage I take as the reference. Then all the currents in the system along the line I can specify the angle of the current with respect to the receiving end voltage. Clear? all the angles I can specify with respect to one common reference that is one way of doing it. That is we say it is the power factor with respect to the receiving end voltage, but supposing I am going to connect a motor right. Let us say there is an industry which is being connected at a particular point in the distributor and the industry load let us say is 10 megawatts at a power factor of 0.8 got it? That is the specification of the load. So, how do we specify a load normally power factor? So, the voltage across the load and the phase of the current with respect to that voltage, got it? So, equipment or normally when you specify the power factor of the equipment, we do it with respect to the voltage across the equipment and the current drawn by the equipment. So, that is called as specifying the PF with respect to the load bus, that bus is the point node, bus means node. In power system when we talk of bus, it is the equivalent of a node in an electric circuit. Okay. So, if I connect the uh, connect a load here, then my current angle that is the power factor angle is specified with respect to the voltage at that point, 
where I am connecting the load, right. Where is my receiving end? Receiving end is somewhere else, receiving end is somewhere else. So, it makes more sense, it makes more sense to specify the power factor with respect to the load bus rather than to the receiving end voltage, because this is more practical, this is more practical, okay. So, this is another way of specifying the power factor. So, there are two ways, one is with respect to the receiving end voltage which can be taken as a reference and another is with respect to the voltage of the load bus itself. These are two different ways of specifying, okay. So, we have power factor with respect to the receiving end voltage. So, we have to derive the phasor diagram. So, we will take this up in the next session.